So we've all heard it said that a, a city is like a living organism. It has a pulse, a heartbeat, it has character and personality. And it, it's something that we have an almost human-like relationship with. And so today I want to play the role of couples therapist and get us talking and thinking about how we can improve that relationship and, uh, and how we can, can get to know our city better and understand it better and deepen our connection with it. Now generally our thinking about cities uh, focuses on how we can make the city work better for us, how we can make it more productive or more livable or more engaging. And all these things are really important, but we have to remember that uh, when trying to improve a relationship, you can't only focus on fixing the other person. You, ha you can't just put your partner on a sit-up regimen and send them to cooking classes. You have to you know, look inwardly and think about, about what you can do differently. And if we really want to make our relationship with our city a more enriching and rewarding experience, then we have to become better listeners. We have to be more curious about our city. We have to seek out moments of intimacy. And we have to get to know the place in a way that only we can. And you know, maybe it wouldn't kill you to stop leaving the toilet seat up either. Um, that's, that's humor. Um, so it's only natural when, uh, when faced with something as, as complex and bewildering as a city to want to, uh, to, to reduce it and to simplify it uh, so that we can start to get a handle on it. You know, we, uh, we divide it up into neighborhoods and we assign those neighborhoods labels so that we can fit them into categories. And then we start ranking things based on which categories they fall into. And it's not a bad way to start getting to know a place, but that approach only takes us so far. And let's think about uh, the parallel to a human relationship. When you meet someone for the first time, you, you categorize them and you rank them in the same way. You know, like, this guy's a Democrat or a Republican, or he's, he's kind and he's funny, or he's boring and he's rude, or, you know, she's, she's uh, tall or loud or well-educated, or she likes bad music. And those are kind of labels that we use to start, to start getting to know someone, to, to think about if there's someone we want to spend more time with. But as you get to know someone better, you start to get a much, a much more nuanced understanding of that person's personality. And you, often you find that the assumptions you made about her based on how you categorized her are way off base. And the things you really treasure about her were totally invisible to you when you first met. Her, her personality is so hidden under the surface and it just takes time and closeness and trust to find out who she really is. So perhaps the idea of moving past those labels of, of getting to know something as, as, uh, as diverse and, and as multifaceted as a city can just be too daunting. And, and sometimes it's so daunting that we feel like we have to turn to others to help us kind of find our way through it all. Uh, so, so maybe we read, we read blogs or guidebooks or magazines, and, and these authorities can, can help us figure out what's worth seeing and what's worth eating and what's worth visiting. And a lot of times that's really great. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly grateful for all the times I've been spared from a, a mediocre, overpriced dinner just by taking the time to read a few reviews beforehand. But this curated approach to life in a city can also be really limiting when it, when it starts to restrict and narrow our ideas about what is worth doing. You know, when we're, when we're racing across town to get to the movies, we often lose sight of, of how how much joy there can be in just walking down the street, you know, in overhearing a, a funny interaction or a touching conversation, in, you know, gaining some insight into people's personalities or finally figuring out what some mysterious part of the city's infrastructure is for or just catching a, a beautiful reflection of the sky in a car's windshield. Um, And it's like we're stuck in that early part of the relationship when you feel like you always have to have something, you know, something official lined up for when you spend time together, some activity to do. But think about how nice it is when you realize that you're actually comfortable enough around the other person, you like the other person enough to just be together. Uh, <laughs> and, and you can kind of break out of that, of that date template and, and your time together, you know, maybe you just go over to the other person's house and you cook dinner and you talk. And your time together is just more, more meaningful and, and interesting. And it's easier and it's more fluid. Uh, after living in New York for a couple of years, I thought that I knew the city pretty well. And I thought that, that our relationship had kind of advanced out of that dating phase into something more serious. It was only through kind of a weird, a weird sequence of events that I was able to see how much more deeply I could be connected to my surroundings. So in 2010, I decided to, to do a walk across the United States. 
I started here in New York and I ended up in Oregon. But before I had a route in mind, when I would tell people about the idea to do this walk, you know, everyone would inevitably, inevitably have some place that I would have to stop and see along the way. And at first I thought this was great. I was just accumulating this list of amazing places to visit. But I soon realized that if I tried to fit all these places into my route, it would take me years to get across the country, zigzagging from one place to another. You know, there's just no way that I could fit it all in. And then I was kind of put in this awful position of realizing that I just now had to take this whole list of, of amazing places I could go see, and I just had to decide what I was going to miss out on. So instead, I decided, mostly out of laziness, just to kind of throw out the whole idea of having destinations and highlights on my route. I just picked a point on the other side of the country and I asked Google Maps to tell me how to get there. So I no longer knew anything about my route. I had nothing I was looking forward to along the way, just some beach on the Pacific, 3,100 miles away. And just like that, the world opened up to me. Uh, you know, the, uh, all my previous traveling had involved kind of racing from place to place, trying to fit in as many guidebook highlights as I could just kind of cursing the long stretches of road that kept me from being where I really wanted to be. But this walk was just the opposite, because without a, a list of highlights along my route, I was just free to, to enjoy and appreciate every place that I visited without feeling like I'm wasting my time doing something silly. So, you know, uh, we don't think of, say, North Dakota as being a, as being a particularly uh, exciting place, but, but just kind of moving slowly with my eyes open I, I found in North Dakota, uh, with my eyes open and, and free of the kind of expectations that, that color uh, destination-based travel, I found in North Dakota, just, it, it was full of beauty and, uh, and wonder and... unique creations and just some kind of indescribable, unforgettable moments. And, and it was amazing, but, but it was an amazing a way, in a way that's, that can't really be captured by guidebooks and travel shows. And, and it's even hidden to people who've, who've you know, covered that same trip in a car countless times. It's just kind of an interminable, interminable bore when you're driving. But on foot, the, the whole landscape just kind of comes alive. And similarly, uh, a project that I'm working on now is uh, it's like a multi-year quest to walk every block of every street in all five boroughs of New York City. It's about eight or 9,000 miles altogether. And what I found in doing that and wandering through these unfamiliar parts of the city is that it, it's just such a, uh, it's such a powerful way of redefining the city. Because I'm just there at street level, and instead of taking someone else's word for it all, I'm seeing things firsthand and up close. I'm seeing, uh, seeing people's faces, the ways that they interact with each other. People's houses, the, way, the ways that people live. People's gardens their art, the ways that they express themselves, and the ways that, the ways that people solve problems. And it's really forced me to, to rethink a lot of the easy stereotypes and convenient narratives that I've heard, which I think is particularly important in a place as over-narrativized as New York. So without any Without any uh, objectives, without any expectations, I can just kind of wander and let my own personal interests and my own quirks just guide me. And I found myself drawn into and fascinated by so many things that I never had the time to stop and look at before when I was always on the way to somewhere else. Um, and it's not the kind of like big and exciting stuff that filled my early days in New York. You know, that the period of infatuation was over long ago. New York and I are no longer regularly making out on the subway in the middle of the night, but now we're, you know, we're, we're talking about our favorite books and we're making each other laugh and we're visiting her mother in the hospital. And we're just getting to know each other in a, in a much subtler and deeper and more interesting way. And so to kind of give you a, a concrete example of all this metaphorical relationship crap I've been talking about, uh, I, I was just recently walking through Brooklyn Heights and I was thinking about this talk, and I realized that the very blocks that I was walking, 
kind of perfectly exemplify this kind of personal relationship that I've been talking about. So here's what I saw on just a short four block stretch of the neighborhood. Uh, so the first thing I noticed was, uh, was this kind of intricate uh, metal disc in the sidewalk. And I had seen a number of these around. They're, they kind of look like manhole covers, but they're not big enough for a person to fit through. So I just Googled the name I saw on one of them, and it turns out that it's a coal chute cover. So this dates these houses back to the days when everyone used coal furnaces, and the delivery men would just shovel coal down into the chute and then go into the furnace room of the house. And of course, it was important that these were smaller than a manhole to prevent burglars from crawling through and getting into people's houses. And so this, this is kind of interesting, but it also answered, uh, it also explained these other kind of mysterious things I've been seeing, these similarly sized circles of mismatched concrete. So this is from where people removed the, uh, the, the cover in front of their house and just totally sealed up the coal chute. Now, if we kind of zoom in up there, uh, you can see here, this is a boot scraper, and it's kind of built into the railing of the steps. So this dates back to the days before automobiles when people used horses to get around. And of course, in those days, the streets were full of horse crap, and they were also really muddy, and anyone walking down the street would just have their shoes covered in filth. And so before going inside, they would go up to these boot scrapers and just kind of scrape all the muck off the bottom of their boot on this thin piece of metal here. And I always love things like this where like the history of a place is kind of embedded in its physical structure. Uh, so moving on down the block, I noticed this fig tree poking out from behind a construction fence. I didn't know this before I started this walk, but there are a ton of fig trees in New York City. And once, I, once I found out what they were and what they looked like, I started seeing them everywhere. And so I got kind of curious about them, and I just read up on figs a little bit. And it turns out figs are really fascinating. Um, so a fig is actually an inside-out inflorescence, which means that each of these hundreds of little fleshy tubes inside the fig is actually a flower. Now, of course, for a plant to reproduce, it has to have its flowers pollinated. So it seems like a pretty bad idea to hide all of your flowers inside of a fig. But it turns out that there is this tiny type of wasp that is co-evolved with the fig, and it can crawl in through this little opening in the base of the fig, and it goes inside and it lays its eggs inside the fig and in the process pollinates all the flowers. Now don't be grossed out. The figs that you eat do not have uh, wasp larvae in them, I promise. It's a long story, but we can discuss it later if anybody is concerned. Um, so moving on to the next block, uh, you know, we have what looks to be kind of like a non, some nondescript row houses. But if you look carefully, this one in the middle is kind of odd. The windows are all blacked out. There's this vent above the door. And if that black car weren't in the way, and he here's a picture from Google Street View, uh, you can see there's this, this red pipe right here. And if you walk up to it and read the sign on it, you find out that that's a subway standpipe, which means that if there were a fire in the subway, a fire truck could come, hook its hose up to that, and water could pump down through a tube into the subway tunnel. Now, that's a pretty strange thing to have on somebody's property. But it's there because this is not an actual residence. No one lives in this building. It's just this incognito ventilation building for the subway. So if you were to walk inside, you wouldn't see any furniture or anything. You'd just see a set of stairs. And if you go down those stairs, you'd end up in the subway tunnel where the number four and five trains run. Uh, so continuing on down the block, I came up on this building. And you may don't notice it at first, but, but up on the top on the wall, just below the roof line, you can see this beam kind of sticking out. And so we already know this area dates back to the days of horses. And that beam kind of looks like maybe it used to hold a pulley, where people would, people would use it to hoist up bales of hay into the hayloft at the top of a stable. And it's all, I think it's always really cool when a place can actually answer your questions about it. So as I got up closer, I noticed there was actually a plaque on the building saying that it, in fact, used to be a stable. And then finally, just past the end of the block, uh, we have th these bears, these bears are just a dead giveaway. This is, this is the work of Henry Stern. He was a former parks commissioner, and he was a really eccentric guy. I don't have time to go into all the stories about him, but one of his quirks was he had this obsession with animals, and he had this personal quest to put animal art in every playground in the city. And if you look around now, you see it everywhere. It's three-dimensional sculptures, or like two-dimensional silhouettes on fences, or footprints embedded in the pavement. One time he was even called into a city council hearing, 
and he was questioned about how much money he was spending out of the Parks Department limited budget just to make all these animals. And his response was, you know, there are some people who don't like art. They're called Philistines. So he was, uh, he was obviously quite a character, and I've just been able to learn a lot about him through my walk. And uh, so, so hopefully that gives you a little bit, a little sense into what kind of my personal New York is like and the relationship I've been able to cultivate with the city just by wandering around. Um, now, you're, you're, all, you're all seekers and explorers and curious people, and you don't need me to tell you how to walk, obviously. Uh, but, so I just encourage you to to work on providing yourself with an environment in which your innate curiosity can flourish, kind of free of the restraints of expectations and categories and labels. So just you know, pick a random point on a map and walk there, or go out at lunchtime and, and explore a few new blocks near your office each day, or just take a bus somewhere you haven't been and spend an hour wandering around. And it's kind of useful to, to have like a structured approach, uh, just to, to give you an official reason to get out there on a regular basis. But, but don't, you know, don't try to seek out anything particular, and don't, don't worry about trying to figure out how this place compares with this place. You know, don't, don't even bother trying to draw any conclusions at all from what you see. Just walk and be present and just appreciate what's around you. Um, and just, just listen to what the city has to tell you and, and cherish the moments of, of intimacy that the two of you share. And just let, your own, just let your own unique instincts guide you as you explore the sinuous curves of the city's body. You know what? Let's scratch that last line. That was weird. Uh, metaphor over. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.